chapter 19, verses 45 through 48. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, this is Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 45. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. So, most of you know uh, that I was saved uh, sometime 16 years ago. It was April 27, 2003, when I got saved. I was saved in a church in Charlotte called Central Church of God, uh, a great church, and uh, under a great pastor. His name is Loran Livingston, and he's still there. And I was blessed to uh, sit under Loran's teaching for a good three or four years. And uh, he was a, a, a great preacher and a great pastor. And uh, one of the things he taught me and taught the congregation is something that I continue to pass on to you. And that is the importance of reading your scripture and praying daily. Read and pray, read and pray, read and pray is what Loran used to tell us. And as I read today's passage in preparation for the sermon, I was reminded of Loran's teaching to read and pray because Jesus says the same thing about the house of God. He says, my house is to be a house of prayer. And then he goes on in the passage to teach in it daily. And of course, we know he's teaching God's word. And so that's really the message for us today. God's house is to be a house of prayer and a house of God's word and a house for all people. And we need to keep it that way. If we turn from prayer and turn from the scripture, then we're going to risk turning over the church to those who would use it for profit or to oppress the weak or to use it to their own ends and silence the truth of Scripture. And so let's take a look at this passage here and see how we might better handle the temple or the house of God. It starts out here in verse 45, Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. Now we know from Mark's Gospel that this is the next day after the triumphal entry. So this is now Monday, the Monday of Passion Week. And even though we're not in Passion Week, this is where we are in, in the Gospel of Luke, and so we'll go on, and the crucifixion will come up on Friday of this passage. But Jesus came in last week as a king, pronounced as a king. Today, he's going to play both the role of the priest and the prophet. As a priest, he's going to cleanse the temple, and as the prophet, he's going to proclaim the Word of God. So he comes into the temple area and begins to drive out those who were selling. And I think it's interesting, in the Greek, that word to drive out is ekbalo, which is the same Greek word that means to cast out. And we read it most often when they're casting out demons. And it strikes me that there's a great parallel there, that the people who have perverted the temple of God by making it into a marketplace are no better than the demons uh, who run around. Jesus says to them as he drives them out, it is written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And here Jesus is quoting two of the Old Testament prophets, both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah in regard to the um, house of prayer and Jeremiah in regard to the den of robbers. I'm going to turn there just for a moment so you can get the context of what he's saying. In Isaiah 56, it says, This is what the Lord said: says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the man who holds fast to it, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, 
who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And to foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to serve Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship Him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this is really what Luke is getting to. Because Luke, as you recall, very much is concerned about the poor and oppressed, the foreigner, the alien, and so forth. Anyone who has been excluded from the temple, Luke wants them to know that they are included. Luke himself was a Gentile, a non-Jew. He had been excluded from the temple. Luke wants people to know that all people, the eunuch who was barred from the temple, the foreigner who was barred from the temple, God's intention for his house was to be a house for all people. In Jeremiah chapter 7, it gets to this issue of the den of robbers. Beginning in verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 7, it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house, and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And, when, and then come and stand before me in the house which bears my name and say we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bear my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. You see, the problem here was the people had made the temple into a den of robbers, as Jeremiah prophesied. It says that they were casting out the merchants, those who were selling. And Luke is relatively succinct in his passage here, but we know from the other Gospels that they were selling doves and they were also exchanging money. And that helps us to understand a little bit better about what's going on. You see, when you were traveling for the Passover or any other festival and come to the temple, you had to do two things. You had to pay the temple tax, and you had to bring your sacrifice. Now, to pay the temple tax, you could only pay it in the temple shekel. It was a specific coin. Most people traded in Roman denarii. All right, it was a Roman coin, and as you remember from the passage with Jesus when he said, whose image is on the coin, they said, it's Caesar's. Well, having the image of Caesar on the coin was blasphemous to the rulers of the temple, and they said you could only have shekels as the temple tax. And so therefore, if you were traveling from far away and you brought your Roman denarii and you went to pay, you couldn't. You had to exchange it at the temple and get shekels. Well, the problem was the merchants knew that, or the money changers knew that you had to have shekels. And so therefore, they had an exorbitant exchange rate. It's kind of like when you're in the airport and you exchange money in the airport, right? You don't get the good deal. Same thing in the temple. The people would come from traveling around, they'd try to exchange for shekels, and they got ripped off. And this hurt the poor the most. And then when we read of the doves, you have to understand the sacrifices that were offered. If you were a well-off or relatively wealthy person, your sacrifice was a lamb or a goat or maybe even a, a bull. But if you were poor, you couldn't afford those things. And so there was a provision for the poor that their sacrifice only had to be a dove, a relatively inexpensive animal. 
But then think again, if you were traveling, let's say all the way from Nazareth, as Jesus did, all the way down to Jerusalem for the Passover, that's a week's journey. You might even have a dove at home in Nazareth, but then you've got to cage that thing up, you've got to walk it for a week down to Jerusalem, you've got to keep that thing alive, and then, heaven forbid, it escapes, you get to Jerusalem, you're empty-handed. So very often people would sell the animals they had in their hometown, take that money, and then go to the temple with the intention of buying one one when they got there. But of course, that was a problem too, because the merchants knew that. And the people would come, and they would go to buy a cheap dove for a couple of pennies, and they would be charged dollars for it, because the merchants knew they had them over a barrel. And so in that way, they were oppressing the poor as well. And Jesus knew this, and Luke knows this, and Jesus drove them out because they were doing everything the prophets had prophesied about. Taking advantage of the foreigner, taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of the fatherless and the widow. They were not only making the house of God into a marketplace, but they were taking advantage of people, the people that God wanted to come into the house. And so with that, Jesus chases them out and then cleanses the temple so that it's ready to be what it was intended to be, a house of prayer. And we need to remember that. All right? The church in its history has done some bad things. It's done a lot of good things, though. But we've got to remember that the church is always open to all people. This is not to be a place of commerce. We have a rule, actually, within the church that you cannot sell on church property for personal gain. All right, and that's a good rule, and we're going to keep that rule. This house needs to be a house of prayer for all people. So anyone should be allowed to come in those doors and hear the Word of God preached. And that's something we need to hold fast to. Our prayer is important. Because as we do it every week, God hears our prayer, And then he responds in his way, by his will. And as I often say, let us align our will with God's will because he has whatever's right for us. But it concerns me that there's many so-called evangelical leaders who have taken positions that I would say are against people whom God would like to see come to the temple. Taking positions against the foreigner in particular. And I don't want this to be overly political, but all people are made in the image and likeness of God. And we must treat them with dignity and respect. And so we should support all of those who are helping the needy, the poor, the disenchanted, those who really are coming to this country to seek freedom and a better life. When I was a kid and you asked about the American dream, We were told the American dream is, I want my kids to have a better life than I had. And that's what the American dream needs to stay. The American dream, to some degree, has become, I want this country to be better for me. And really, I think it needs to be better for our children and all people. And so I want us all to remember that this is the land of the free and the land of the brave. And I want us all to lift up this nation in prayer, understanding that while we have our faults, we have great strengths. And those strengths come from all the people who are drawn to this country. And I would pray that we continue to bless those people lest we turn this house into something other than a house of prayer. Jesus goes on in verse 47. It says, Every day He was teaching at the temple, But the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could could not find a way to do it because they hung on his words. The second thing we see Jesus doing with the temple in addition to prayer is teaching God's word. And that again is what this house must be about. In addition to be a house of prayer, it must be a house of God's word. And we must preach from the Bible continuously. It says he taught every day in the temple. And what do you suppose he was teaching? He was teaching the Scripture. He was teaching from the Torah, God's Word. He was teaching the truth. And it says that the leaders, the Pharisees, the the scribes, and then it also says 
the leaders among the people. All right, in the Greek, it's the first men of the city, all right, which means the merchants, the ones who just got kicked out of the temple. They want their revenge. They want to get Jesus out of the temple and get business started again. Jesus can be bad for business. Paul will have the same thing. He'll go to Ephesus, I believe it is, and he'll preach, and all of the people will throw away their idols, and the silversmiths go crazy because their silver business, their idol business, goes broke because Paul is preaching the Word of God and people are throwing away their idols. The house is to be a house of God's Word. And it says that they want to kill him. Now that word, I'm not so sure that that's a good translation. The word is apollyon in Greek, and it can mean to kill. It most often means to destroy, or it also can be mean lost. When we read about the lost coin and the lost sheep, that word apollyon was the same word. And I think at this stage of the game, where we're at the beginning of the week, they really just want to get rid of him. They want him lost. They want him destroyed, at least his reputation. But what does it say? Why can't they do that? Why can't they destroy him? Because the people are hanging on every word. The people are hanging on every word. And what are the words that he's speaking? He's speaking the word of God. You see, no one can stand against you if you're preaching the word of God. They can try. They can try to silence you as they're trying to silence Jesus. But the Word of God is eternal and authoritative, and it is there for all time. And no one can stand against God's Word. Charles Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers. And he said something that I posted actually uh, about a week ago. If I did not believe in the infallibility of Scripture, the absolute infallibility of it from cover to cover, I would never enter this pulpit again. And when I posted that, I said, every pastor needs to stand by that. If this Bible is not true, then I'm wasting my time and your time. If this is not the inerrant, infallible, eternal, authoritative Word of God by which we should set our faith in life, then we're wasting our time. And we need to continue to have a high view of Scripture. When I went to seminary, or actually before I went to seminary, I was looking at seminaries, and I had the opportunity to sit down with one of the seniors at Reformed Theological Seminary where I went, RTS. And I asked him, what's the differentiator between RTS and other seminaries? And his answer was quick and specific. We have a high view of Scripture. And for me, that was it. I was like, I'm here. Because that's it. If you hold a high view of Scripture, you will not go astray. But unfortunately, many of the churches today have lowered their view of Scripture. There was a survey by the Barna Company of pastors asking how they hold a biblical worldview. And they asked certain questions to determine if they hold a biblical worldview. I'm happy to say at the time, the Southern Baptist pastors scored the highest at 71%. That means 29% don't hold a biblical worldview. The church that held the lowest, the pastors, 27% was the United Methodist Church. And we see some of the very difficult times they're going through right now. But that's because of the low view of Scripture. So long as we hold up Scripture high and trust in God's Word, we will be able to stand against anything. And so we individually must be steadfast in our high view of Scripture. We can't let that drop. If we drop our view of Scripture, we drop our biblical worldview, and we begin to accept things that are against God's Word. If we stand on the authority of Scripture, no one can stand against us because we have God's Word behind us. And so as I come to a close on this passage, let me remind you of the things that Jesus said about the temple of God. It's to be a house of prayer and a house of God's Word. Jesus was speaking at the time of the physical temple where He was. Now that temple no longer stands, as you all know. 
But where is the temple of God today? The temple of God is not just this building, but more specifically, the temple of God is the body of every believer. The Scripture says that the Holy Spirit comes to live within you when you believe, and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. And so I want you to apply these lessons today, not to this church building, although we should. I want you to apply it to your own temple, the temple of your own body. Is your own body a house of prayer? Is your own body a house of God's Word? Are you feeding yourself with God's Word? Are you lifting up your prayers and praise to God on a daily basis? We must. We should. And it's the teaching of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We have the altar call every Sunday. And I often say it's the most important part of the service because someone can come forward to give their life to Christ. Someone can come forward just to share a need or praise privately with me. Or someone can come forward to join this church. It doesn't have to happen here, though. People can come to Christ anywhere. If you are the temple of God, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing stopping you from leading someone to Christ out there. They don't have to come into the church. Praise God, they do. If you're out there and you're in prayer and people see you, they may respond. Just this week, just this week, I was at the men's breakfast. And I was taught by the Gideons, all right? You can learn from everybody well if you spend time and listen. The Gideons, the first time I went to breakfast with one of the Gideons, asked the waitress, we're about to say a prayer for you. We're about to say a prayer. Is there anything we can pray for you? And then the woman answered. So at the men's breakfast, I pulled our waitress aside. Now, she's the same woman who serves these 30 men every Wednesday morning for breakfast. And I said, the Lord just inspired me, and I said, is there anything I can pray for you? And she said, yes. She said, July 16th, I'm having a surgery. All right, can you pray for me? This woman is a waitress. You and I know that this woman is making her money off of tips. This is how she gains her living. If she's not working, she's not earning income. And so I challenged all the men that morning. I said, this woman waits on you every Wednesday. Tip her well, because she's going to be out of work for a couple of weeks and have no income. Right? That was a blessing of the Lord. And it was just a simple, can I pray for you question. All right, maybe that will lead to bringing her to, the, to Christ. I don't know. But it's a great message to hear. Always bring the Lord out into the world. And lead somebody to Christ. But while we're here, I'm going to make that offer again. The house of God is for all people. All you need to do is turn your life over to Him in repentance and faith. Come forward, confess your sin, and ask for salvation, and the Lord grants it. I told you 16 years ago, April 27, 2003, I did just that. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was on my way to hell. The pastor's sermon convicted me, and I came forward. And that day, I felt the sin of the world just drop off of me. Frankly, my sin, not the sin of the world. My sin just washed away in the blood of Christ. And you can have that today too. Those of you who have given your life to Christ, if you would like to come forward and share a praise or a prayer request with me privately, you're welcome to do that as well. Then, of course, if anyone here would like to become a member of the church and be a part of this fellowship, I welcome you to come down as well. I always say that if you visit the church, it's like dating. When you come down the aisle, it's like getting married. So you can make that commitment today. But Terry, would you please lead us in the invitational hymn? And as he does, if the Spirit moves you, please come forward for any reason that God might bring you here. All to Jesus I surrender. It's hymn number 596 is our invitational hymn. Would you stand while we pray? 
while we sing in the house of prayer. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, Holy Thine, may Thy Holy Spirit fill me, may I know Thy power divine. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And now that may the Lord bless you and keep you and draw you closer to himself. Let him help you to be a house of prayer and a house of his word as you go into a dark world that needs salt and light. In Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Amen.